Now remember, our goal is to find out the answer to the question, why does the Wi-Fi work so much slower at hotspot than at home in general? So we would like to find out the performance of this S, okay, which we just derived an expression, approximation expression of it, um, as a function of the number of stations, number of users out there, N. So now we're going to walk through a numerical example. First, we'll define the length of the time slots. Suppose we're using 802.11G Wi-Fi, which transmit at 54 megabit per second. And here are the relevant timing parameter. Okay, Each uh, single time slot is 9 microsecond. Everything is a microsecond. Okay? And then the SIFS is 10 microsecond and the diffs is SIFS plus two time slots uh, units which is 28 microseconds. Okay, So now we can look at TB that is the time slot length for a backup slot with idle channel. Okay, That's the length of diffs so that's just 28 microsecond. What about the time slot for a successful transmission? That means we have the data frame itself plus waiting SIFs plus acknowledgement packet plus waiting diffs. This totality is the uh, TS. <clears throat> so let's look at the time it takes to send this um, data. Now the data consists of a header and then the payload, the header and then the payload. Okay. First of all, there is a 16 microsecond physical layer preamble. You just, you know, waste 16 microsecond as a guard band in time. And then there is a 40 bits physical la uh, header, physical layer header with information about the physical layer configuration. The first 24 bits is sent at a much lower speed. Instead of 64, it's sent at 6 megabit per second so that it is uh, has a much higher chance of being properly decoded at the receiver end. So there's 24 of them over 6 megabit per second. Okay, Since it's microsecond, this is megabit per second, uh, the factors cancel each other out. You can just write as 24 over 6. And then there are 16 remaining one plus 240 MAC layer, link layer header, okay, plus 32 bit of error correction codes in the link layer. All these are sent at the rate of 54 megabit per second. Plus, of course, the actual payload. This part is L bits, okay, and we're going to later assume that L is uh, uh, basically. Uh, 8,192 bits. Okay, so it's a typical value of the number of uh, bits in the payload. Okay, so now payload is sent at 54 megabit per second. So this boils down to 25.33 plus the payload, say this number or some other number, over 54 microsecond. Okay, that's the length of TS. So finally, what about TC, collision? <clears throat> well, there's actually a couple of different variations of how pe people define TC, but I think the proper way is to define it as it's essentially the same as TS, okay? because you have to wait until the diff period is over before you can be guaranteed that the acknowledgement is indeed not sent back to you. So we have defined these parameters. Okay, now let's also define some other parameter. Let's say the maximum number of backup stages you can have in exponential backup is three. So you can multiply by two, by two, by two, then you stop and declare the frame is lost. The minimum window of time that you need to wait is let's say um, two to the four minus one. Okay, in our analysis, we ignore this minus one factor. But here we can just say, uh, incorporate that, and that is 15. And we just defined L to be uh, 8,192 bits. So now we have all the parameters, and therefore we can plug it in. Okay, we can plug in the formula. First, we can plug in a formula 
of the tau and C solution. Turns out we can solve numerically tau to be 0 0.0765. That is basically a 7.65% as the contention probability, the probability you will transmit as a single station. And then this lead to PTPS calculation, which leads to the S calculation, together with all those constants. Okay. The exact blown out form of the formula is in the textbook, and or you can just verify that through your own uh, uh, calculation. Okay. So now we're going to look at this S as a function of few things. First of all, as a function of N, the number of user stations, or in other words, the impact of crowd's size. So now I'm plotting S in megabit per second over N here. If you look at the aggregate, okay, S as a function of N for all, then it goes up and then it goes down. Now goes up is actually very understandable because I've got more stations, but it quickly start to go down. This is the point where basically the tragedy of commons kicks in so much that uh, adding more users will reduce even the total throughput across all users, and this happened around eight users. Okay. And if you look at the total throughput divided by n, okay, s of n over n, that's the average per station throughput, then they actually always go down. It never goes up, well, because you add more users, add more interference. What is important is that it goes down so rapidly as you go from like two, three users down to 10, uh, 15 users. It went down from 25 or so megabit per second. Now notice not 54 because 54 is the physical layer speed. Okay, after the, over the overhead, uh, it goes down to about 25 realistic speed. This is a theme we'll pick up in next lecture. In today's lecture, we'll notice the shape of this drop. This drop is dropping very rapidly, okay, to the point of going down all the way to like one or two megabit per second. So no wonder in a busy hotspot, uh, the average per station throughput is so low because despite all the smart ideas, CSMA, random access, controls transit commons in a very inefficient way. Now, a few more charts, for example, we can also measure S as a function of aggressiveness. One way to look at aggressiveness is look at the minimum window size you have to wait up to that point. Now, we see that for different size of the crowd, all happens that initially, okay, uh, if you, as you make W min a bigger, means you make it, um, you make this uh, uh, contention less aggressive, then the uh, throughput actually goes up. Okay, that's very good. But at some point, it will go down because it is so non-aggressive, you're actually wasting idle resources in the network. So there's a point beyond which uh, being more polite uh, actually hurts your throughput. Again, very typical of a cocktail. You don't want to be too aggressive, but if you are too non-aggressive, then you're just wasting time slots. And as the crowd gets bigger and bigger, okay, we see that the range of a W mean before it start to bend down becomes longer and longer. That means as the crowd gets longer, bigger and bigger, it pays more and more uh, to uh, reduce aggressiveness. Another way to look at aggressiveness is look at um, the maximum number of backoff stages that you allow. As you make B bigger, you tend to increase the average contention window size and therefore become less aggressive. And you see a similar behavior here, okay? Um, as the crowd becomes bigger and bigger, the impact is more prominent, okay? The uh, throughput actually becomes bigger as you become uh, less aggressive. Okay. The impact of B, however, is uh, less prominent than the impact of W min there. Finally, S as a function of the payload size L. Okay, we were talking about somewhere around here. Okay, so get around 25 uh, megabit per second. Now you see a monotonic increasing curve because more payload means less overhead, relatively speaking. 
But this is a misleading chart because remember all the way back early in the lecture, we did not model the actual interference or collision phenomena accurately. As the payload gets bigger and bigger, actually, the chance of collision goes up because the chance of two packets actually overlapping in time goes up as it takes longer to transmit the payload. Okay. If you incorporate that factor, then this actually will start to bend over and downward. So in summary, what we have seen is that in Wi-Fi interference management is done through random access rather than in power control as in cellular. And a big part of the reason is because it's operating in the unlicensed spectrum. There are a few very good ideas, including randomized and exponential backup, including differentiated wait and listen intervals, including limited explicit message passing, which by the way, the RTS CTS is not always enabled. That may also explain some of the inefficiency of throughput in hotspots. But it's got a big limitation. Now we went through a simple, relatively speaking, but still a little bit involved approximation of the throughput. And we saw that this throughput per station as a function of n drops rapidly. The performance degrades very fast as the contention intensifies, even as we go up from several users to just say 10 or 15 users. And this is the underlying reason why the performance in the hotspot tend to be poor unless you don't have a a large crowd so happens and we see a fundamentally different way to do distributed coordination in taming this tragedy of commons so now we're going to wrap up uh, our wireless lectures with one more lecture on a very practical important question what is the actual speed that i can expect on my cellular lte or 3g network that'll be the next lecture and see you then <laughs>